minimizing unwanted effects is something everyone strives for. That's why microdosing is so effective, because you derive the maximum benefit from taking the minimum effective dose. People microdose for many different reasons. For relaxation, to gain control of their mental health, or performance and recovery. I use microdose for stress relief and to help with sleep. And Friday night at the end of my work week, it helps me ease into the weekend and ramp down for my stressful day job, which perpetually overworks me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Microdose Gummies and Lumi Labs. Microdose Gummies deliver perfect, entry-level doses of THC that help you feel just the right amount of good. I love this company and personally use their products. The gummies are organic, gluten-free, and they taste good. Microdose is available nationwide. To learn more about Microdose and THC, go to microdose.com and use code BEYOND to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. Links can be found in the show description. But again, that's microdose.com and code B-E-Y-O-N-D. This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. So I try to put out episodes on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month, and usually the episode goes out late on Wednesday night because I'm always working up to my deadline. This is especially accurate right now because my day job has me working 65 hours a week because there's this thing called money and we all need it to live. I had to push last week's episode to this week because I've been so sick for the past two weeks that I can't recall feeling this awful in years. I've lost my voice for days on end, and I'm still struggling with it, which is pretty crazy. Cold and flu season is here, so try to stay healthy, because this sucks. For today's episode, we are heading to Appleton, Wisconsin, and focusing on the College Avenue area. There was a club called the Luna Lounge. This club did not have a stellar reputation. Police had been called there 72 times in 2013, which was more than any other bar in the downtown Appleton area. There was an unfortunate incident that took place there at the end of 2013. The club eventually closed in 2015, and I think a restaurant took its place. You're listening to Episode 88, Joshua Richards. 25-year-old Joshua Richards was a car mechanic, and he was working on helping his friend Galen with his new business. Joshua was converting old-school buses into party buses. People could drink on the bus and be driven to a particular destination. On December 7, 2013, Joshua and his friend were going to take the first steps with their business and open the party bus up to general admission. People paid $10 per ticket, and the bus would pick everyone up in Green Bay and drive them to Appleton, Wisconsin, which was about a 30-minute ride. The bus would let everyone off in downtown Appleton so they could party. The intention was to pick everyone up at bar time and drive them back to Green Bay. Joshua and his girlfriend, Brittany, rode on the party bus to Appleton, and they ended up at 344 West College Avenue, which was a club called the Luna Lounge. On December 8, 2013, at 1.50 a.m., police responded to a call that came from the Luna Lounge, and the caller reported gunshots at the club. Police responded quickly and arrived on the scene one to two minutes after the shot was fired. At the club, they found a man who was shot in the head and was lying on the floor by the bar's entrance. The victim's name was Joshua Richards. They rushed him to a local hospital where he died. Investigators found a shell casing near the club's entrance. The shell casing was for a twenty five caliber handgun. Some witnesses reported Joshua was involved in an argument but alcohol did not fuel the disagreement, as Joshua had not been drunk. A security guard told authorities he remembered a few Asian individuals leaving the club, and he thought that they had on lighter clothing. When the security video from that night was slowed down and reviewed frame by frame, it actually showed three individuals 
who ran from the club's entrance after the shooting. One man appeared to have an object in his hand, which could have been a gun. Investigators then reviewed traffic cameras in the area to track the three suspects as they fled the club. The men headed west out of the club's entrance, and on one of the traffic cameras, it appeared they had changed or discarded their clothing. The men were initially wearing lighter clothing, and were later seen on camera having darker clothing, which investigators thought was suspicious. Police looked through a dumpster on the 200 block of North Division Street and recovered a white vest and a red ball cap, which were clothing discarded by the suspects. Joshua Richards' girlfriend, Brittany Olson, had been with them at the Luna Lounge. She said until the altercation, the night had been uneventful with no trouble. They had ridden a bus from Green Bay to Appleton, where the group planned to go bar hopping in the downtown area. The group dispersed once they left the bus, and Brittany and Joshua ended up at the Luna Lounge. They went to the dance floor and mostly remained there until bar closing. Brittany and Joshua headed to the door to leave the club when a group of men and one woman approached them when they were trying to exit. There was a brief altercation, which Brittany tried to break up. But before she knew it, Joshua was on the ground. She yelled for people to call 911, and ran after the woman who was in the group who had approached them. Brittany tackled the woman, telling her she knew who the men who hurt Joshua were and knew where they ran off to. Brittany had been drinking, but remembered kneeling next to Joshua when the police arrived. Additional officers were called, and they prevented any more people from leaving the club. Brittany Olson had tackled a woman named Allison. She was at the club with a few men. Allison identified the three suspects who were seen running as Paul Thor, Paul Lee, and Fong Lee. Allison also admitted she was there with Chong Lee, who had not been on the investigator's radar. Paul Lee and Chong Lee were brothers. Fong Lee was not related to Paul or Chong, but Lee was a common name in the Fox Valley Hmong community. Everyone had split up at various points after they arrived at Luna. Allison remembered that Paul Lee was in the foyer and there was a brief altercation with Joshua. There was a bright flash that caused her to run, but she didn't know where the flash came from. Allison didn't see the gun or who fired the shot. Police later questioned Allison at her job in Milwaukee and another witness named Tao Shao Ali. Allison said she did not know who committed the shooting. When her friend called and asked her who the shooter was, Allison said she didn't know. She didn't realize at the time, but police were listening to her call because they did not believe her. Tao Shou Ali saw the altercation at the Luna Lounge. She witnessed Paul throw a punch at Joshua and then take a step back. She then saw Chong Li approach Joshua. It looked like Chong was going to throw a punch with his right hand. Instead, she heard a boom and Joshua fell to the ground. On December 11, 2013, investigators interviewed three witnesses, Watao Lee, Mikey Tao, and Ryan Tao. They were at the club and were standing a few feet away from the shooter. They were asked to identify the shooter, but none of the witnesses could say who pulled the trigger. Ryan thought the shooter had come from the bar into the foyer area with a couple of other people. All three witnesses were worried that their safety was in jeopardy and didn't want to be involved in the case. Police held their interview audio tapes for several months and then destroyed them to honor their wishes to conceal their identities. Investigators interviewed the suspects, and Fong Li and Joe Thor initially denied being at the Luna Lounge that night. Joe later admitted he was lying because he was scared. Fong Lee and Joe Thor did not see who shot Joshua. Joe witnessed Paul Lee hitting Joshua. The men said they dumped their clothing because they were scared that they would be blamed for the shooting. Police interviewed Paul Lee that same night. Investigators were convinced he was the shooter, as they saw something in his hand in the video at the Luna Lounge entrance. Paul admitted that Joshua Richards had approached them and a fight broke out. 
Before Paul could even throw a punch, Joshua had been shot. On December 12th, police interviewed Paul Lee again. He was in police custody because they believed he had pulled the trigger. They confronted Paul Lee about the object in his hand, and he told investigators he wasn't holding a gun. It was his e-cigarette. After investigators pressed Paul Lee, he said his brother was going to hate him for this and named his brother Chong Lee as the shooter. Investigators switched gears and began looking into Chong Lee. Investigators re-reviewed the video footage from the Luna Lounge and confirmed that Chong Lee had entered the foyer area of the club 14 seconds before Joshua was shot. Paul Lee, Fong Lee, and Joe Thor had all exited the club first and headed west. Chong Lee exited six seconds later and headed east. After ditching their clothing in a dumpster, Paul Lee, Fong Lee, and Joe Thor all met up at Joe's house. Chong showed up at Joe's house a little while later. Joe realized Chong was the shooter when he recognized Chong's shirt was the same one the shooter had been wearing. Chong also said that he point-blanked him. Joe Thor drove Chong Lee to Milwaukee that night because he was afraid to disagree with Chong's wishes. During the drive, Chong admitted he flushed the gun down the toilet at the Sharks Club on 318 West College Avenue before arriving at Joe's house. Joe and Chong spent that night at a hotel in Milwaukee. Chong asked Joe to buy a vehicle for him so he could leave town. Investigators interviewed several women in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They said that Chong told them he pulled the trigger. Police found six 25 caliber bullets at the Sharks Club, two of which were lodged in a toilet. They were the same size as the casing found at the Luna Lounge. Police searched for the gun used in the shooting and examined all 22 tables at the Sharks Club and looked at the plumbing. They pulled a cell phone from the sewage storage pit but didn't find the gun. Appleton's utilities director believed the story about flushing the gun down the toilet was far-fetched. The bar's plumbing funnels to a two-inch pipe before entering the city's wastewater treatment system. Two female witnesses came forward and told investigators they saw a man who matched the description of Chong Lee. He came into the Sharks Club on the night of the shooting. Chong Lee had on a white vest with a dark shirt in the Sharks Club, which matched the same clothing that was seen in the Luna Lounge video. Investigators tracked Chong Lee to that hotel in Milwaukee and confirmed on surveillance video that he was there after the shooting. Investigators continued tracking Chong Lee, and he was staying at his family's house. He was arrested and taken into custody. Like the others, Chong initially denied being at the Luna on the night of the shooting. He eventually admitted to being at the club but claimed to not know who the shooter was. Chong Lee was unemployed and had been convicted of being party to a burglary in 2003. They sentenced him to five years in prison and five years of probation. In 2004, they convicted him of being party to a burglary in Winnebago County, and he received 10 years of probation. In 2012, they charged him with second-degree sexual assault of a child Chong Lee was 26 years old when he impregnated a 15-year-old girl. The minor did not want to testify because she was worried about backlash. After Chong's first court appearance, his family members followed the minor from the courthouse and harassed her. They even blocked her car from exiting. They convicted Chong Lee on amended charges of fourth-degree sexual assault, and he only received nine months in jail. If she would have been protected, the 15-year-old girl could have testified, and Chong Lee might have been convicted on the original charges, and he would have received 25 years. Instead, he received the reduced charges and got out of prison. Two months later, Chong Lee shot Joshua Richards. From jail, 
Chong called outside and spoke with various individuals. He said that the eyewitnesses to the shooting needed to disappear. After Chong was arrested, police searched his jail cell in his friend's apartment. They found a letter Chong wrote to his friend, Tang Li. He said his brother Paul Li and his friend Joe Thor were going to testify. This needed to be stopped. In a jailhouse call, Chong tried to use another inmate's phone ID number and spoke in both Hmong and English to obscure who he was and what he was saying. The call Chong made was to his brother, 27-year-old Hu Li. This case depended on Paul and Joe's statements, and if they didn't show up, there would be no case. At the time, Paul and Joe agreed to not testify and were willing to do time for not showing up in court. Investigators charged Hugh Lee with two counts of witness intimidation. On December 16, 2013, Chong Lee was charged with first-degree intentional homicide by use of a dangerous weapon and possession of a firearm by a felon. He was later charged with four counts of felony intimidation of a witness as a party to a crime and solicitation of perjury. Chong was held on a $1 million bond. As they had linked him to a street gang, and he had a criminal record. In April 2015, police re-interviewed three witnesses, Watao Li, Mikey Tao, and Ryan Tao. Police had destroyed their original audio tapes to protect their identity because they were afraid. Ultimately, these witnesses were not important to the case. Two of the witnesses didn't know Chong, and the other witness knew Chong but thought he was in jail on the night of the shooting. In September 2015, Chong Lee tried to shake his charges and argued that police violated his rights when they failed to disclose the destroyed interviews with Watao, Mikey, and Ryan. Investigators also destroyed maps drawn by the witnesses besides the interview audio. The court agreed that Chong Lee's rights were violated, but did not agree to dismiss the murder charge. The result was the court said the state could not call those three witnesses to testify. My house has two cats and two dogs, and I really appreciate not having my home smell like a litter box or like a dog that rolled on a bunch of dead worms. You can bring professional quality fragrance to all the spaces that matter, from business to home. Just in time for winter, with Scent Air. For 25 years, Scent Air has been scenting hotels, stores, event spaces, and beyond, year-round. But they also dial up the holly jolly vibes during the holiday season. The Winter Collection is available right now in their online store. The Winter Collection includes limited-release favorites, Gingerbread Man, Noel, and Season's Greeting. Plus, the year-round classic, Pine Forest. All of Scent Air's more than 60 fragrances are phthalate-free, cruelty-free, safe for families, and EcoVeda certified sustainable. The diffuser was extremely easy to set up, and it ensures that my house doesn't smell like Isaac, Roxanne, Lenny, or Squiggy, as much as I love the fur kids. This Black Friday through Cyber Monday, you can save up to 60% off site-wide. As a special bonus, Beyond Contempt listeners can take an extra 25% off with the promo code BEYOND. That's B-E-Y-O-N-D. The jury trial began in late February 2016, and Chong Lee pleaded not guilty. The prosecution said that Paul Lee got into a fight with Joshua Richards, and his brother Chong Lee walked up and shot Joshua in the head. The defense team claimed their client was innocent. They said that Chong's clothing and the direction that he ran did not match the initial descriptions of the people near the shooting, which was true. Witnesses thought the shooter had lighter clothing on, but Chong had a dark shirt with a light vest. A friend of Joshua Richards said the shooter was wearing white and ran down the street with his hands in his pockets. Paul Lee was wearing a white jacket and had his hands in his pockets as he ran down College Avenue. But there was a lot going on when the shooting took place. Some people thought they heard words exchanged between the men, but turned away because they thought the argument was quickly over. After the gunshot, the club turned into chaos, with people rushing out the door in fear. 
Several people testified. Chong told them he committed the shooting. Via Tao testified. Chong admitted he pulled a gun and shot someone during a fight in downtown Appleton. Peter Moa testified he discussed the shooting with Chong, and Chong said, I got him. Kong Vang testified. Chong said he shot someone to protect his brother. Stephanie Tao testified she was at a restaurant with her sister Melanie and Chong Lee on December 9, 2013. He mentioned the Luna Lounge shooting and admitted to the shooting. Chong claimed some guy was going to take a swing at his brother, and that made him mad. Joe Thor testified. Chong admitted he committed the shooting. A police detective testified that during an interview with Fong Lee, he stated he went to Joe Thor's house after the shooting. Chong showed up and said he popped a guy. Paul Lee told the courtroom that he came back from the bathroom and there was a man insulting Fong Lee. He told Joshua Richards to back up, and his group of friends did not want trouble. Paul claimed Joshua responded by making a racial slur. The two men were face to face, and Paul took a swing. Paul backed up when he heard a bang and actually thought Joshua had fired the gun. So he ran out the door with his two friends, Fong and Joe. Paul claimed he didn't know that Chong was even at the Luna Lounge, but Chong showed up at Joe Thor's house later that night. Paul Lee said he didn't remember Chong saying anything about the Luna Lounge. He told the police that Fong and Joe were not the shooters. He didn't remember telling the officer that his brother had ditched the gun. They forced Fong Lee to testify for about 35 minutes. He said Joshua threatened him at the Luna Lounge. Paul Lee got involved and got into a fight with Joshua Richards. Fong was by the door when he heard the gunshot, and he wasn't sure where Chong Lee was during that time. Fong, Paul, and Joe all fled and ended up at Joe's house. In his initial interview with police, Fong said they left after the shot was fired. In court, he said they left before the shooting. Fong was asked about the statements he made to the police after they left the bar. It was at that point where Fong asserted his Fifth Amendment rights. Two hours later, he was granted immunity from prosecution and continued testifying. After the bar, Fong did not recall seeing Chong Li. In a statement to police, Fong said, Chong Li said he had popped the guy. However, at trial, he said he did not remember telling the police that. James Train was called in to testify for the defense. He was an expert crime consultant and a former homicide detective. James reviewed reports, videos, pictures, the autopsy report, witness statements, etc., he considered a few techniques used by police to be problematic. The police used consequences with Fong Lee and Paul Lee. Investigators said they could be charged with the crime if they didn't cooperate, and were offered leniency if they gave up the shooter's name. Sometimes, investigators told witnesses their theory of the case, and it seemed as if detectives wanted to hear that reflected back to them. The medical examiner testified, the victim was shot near his left ear, at relatively close range. This was an execution-style murder. Even though the shooting was not caught on camera and the murder weapon was never recovered, the prosecution effectively told Joshua's story through witness testimony, video footage from the Luna Lounge, traffic cameras in the downtown Appleton area, and video footage from the Hilton in Milwaukee, and also physical evidence that included a shell casing from the crime scene and matching bullets from the 25 caliber handgun found at the Sharks Club. Chong Lee decided to not testify at trial. After four hours of deliberation, the jury found Chong Lee guilty of the homicide charge, the firearm charge, and two out of the four counts of witness intimidation. At sentencing, Joshua's mother, sister, aunt, and stepfather told the judge about the pain they felt once they were told about the shooting. They asked for the maximum penalty, with life in prison without the possibility of parole. Joshua's sister received a call at four in the morning and described it 
is a call that no one should ever receive. She went to the ICU and saw her brother on life support. There was nothing more the doctors could do for him. On June 2, 2016, the judge sentenced Chong Li to life in prison. His first opportunity for parole is February 1, 2048. Chong Li is currently incarcerated at Wapong Correctional Institution in Wisconsin. Chong Li tried to appeal his conviction. However, they upheld his sentence. Fong Li, Paul Li, and Joe Thor were never charged with a crime. Joshua's mother, Jacqueline, sued the Luna Lounge for failing to provide adequate security, which led to her son's death. A judge awarded her $1.5 million. She also filed a wrongful death suit against Chong Li. Jacqueline asked for an unspecified reward and punitive damages. The silver lining was that Joshua's heart and lungs were still living on in other individuals. His family donated his tissues and organs because it was part of his personality and was what he wanted. They even met the man from Illinois who received Joshua's heart. This man was present in the courtroom when Chong Lee's verdict was read. Seven people received his organs, and over a hundred people received Joshua's tissues. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for the links to sources and music used in this episode. Research, writing, editing, audio production, and sound design were performed by me, Renee. Thank you to patron Cindy G. Thank you for supporting the show. And thank you to all the listeners for putting up with my voice this episode. It was a little rough at the end. It's crazy that I've been sick since the end of October. If you like the show, please leave me a positive review in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thank you so much, everyone.